Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and I have the pleasure today to talk to you about animal behavior. Now, animal behavior is simply, I mean, we could relate to this, it's simply everything an animal does <laughs> and how it does it. And so I want to sort of categorize animal behavior under the umbrella of ecology, because ecology, the definition of that is the interaction of organisms and their environment. And so behavior could be sort of viewed in terms of how organisms respond to not only the physical environment in terms of what they do, but also in how they respond to other organisms in terms of what they do. Although the truth is animal behavior is a, such an important discipline that it, it sort of uh, stands on its own. And so I just want to start off with a simple example. We're all familiar with birds singing and we're like, boy, it's so beautiful. And, you know, why do birds sing? You know, it, it's not necessarily music uh, in the bird's viewpoint. And so I want you to sort of think about all of these behaviors that we talk about in this particular video as things that an animal does in order to survive and ultimately if you survive, you're going to leave more offspring and so have a greater fitness. And so in other words, view it in terms of the lens of natural selection and evolutionary biology, because that's really what it's all about. It isn't necessarily, as far as we understand, pleasure. And so what are some of the practical reasons why a bird would sing? This is what we're kind of, you know, coming from. And so practical reasons for singing. And so ultimately it comes down to this basic answer. It's like it's the organisms trying to pass its genes on into the next generation. That's what evolution is all about. But it could be attracting mates. It could be something to let other birds know where they are or simply sort of to hold off a territory. And so these are some of the reasons we think organisms are singing. Now, behavior is beyond just singing. It could be dancing as well. And so animals have amazing courtship. Now, courtship is sort of when you're trying to attract another uh, organism in order to reproduce with. And so such elaborate courtship rituals and behaviors uh, leading to uh, reproductive success are some of the things that we'll be studying. Now, behavior could, again, be anything. It could be a courtship ritual. It could be really the things that an animal does in order to obtain food. So those are foraging behaviors. And that's important because, again, food gives you energy and then your energy you're going to be able to survive, reproduce, and then have a greater fitness, which is the measure of offspring. And so it could be finding a, a, a partner for sexual reproduction. It could be things that you do to maintain homeostasis. What, what I mean by that is if it's very cold, you might your, the behavior might be hibernation. Now, the behavior of hi hibernation, as well as some of these other behaviors, have a physiological component as, as well. And so metabolism slows down and there are some interesting things to discuss there. Um, but we'll sort of stay with the, 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 uh, the responses in terms of behavioral more than we are physiological. So maintaining homeostasis could mean that when it gets cold, organisms might migrate. And so it's what organisms do in order to respond. And so uh, all of these behaviors are subject to natural selection. I know most people think of natural selection as being something that, that nature is selecting, for example, an organism that is really camouflaged to hide in their environment. Well, being camouflaged is an important adaptation, but an adaptation like that is something physical. It's morphological, as we like to say. But behavior what an organism does is also an adaptation. So in other words, wearing clothes is a behavioral adaptation to maintain homeostasis, this kinds of, these kinds of things. So all of this is subject to natural selection. Social behavior, how we communicate with one another, are all behaviors that have been selected through the evolutionary process. And so when people on the street get into these kinds of debates. I hear people talking about this, surprisingly. They'll say, you know, is, is behavior the result of your genes or your environment? In other words, did you, did you learn uh, uh, something and that's why you behave accordingly? Now, learning, just to define that, is a, uh, 
it's be it's experienced based modification of your behavior. In other words, like something happened to you. And so you're going to react differently to that. So you, you've learned. Okay, so is it something that you've learned? Or is it something that's within that sometimes we call innate or instinct, which is subject to just genetic programming. And so we get into this debate, but really, in biology, I just want to make this perfectly clear, there is no debate, because we understand that animal behavior is both controlled by DNA, which is remarkable, and its influence, in other words, your phenotypic behavior is what you do, are clearly, in some instances, adjustable based on learning. And so it is both are involved. And so therefore, it makes it kind of difficult. And so when we say animal behavior, I just want to point this out, we're, you know, where I'd like to include us because we're humans are part of the animal kingdom. But the truth is, most of our studies uh, in animal behavior are organisms other than hum humans, because humans are so variable, so unpredictable, that it sort of excludes our ability to sort of quantify it through science. And so we have kind of a tangent discipline that goes along with animal behavior, which is psychology, where we can s s sort of overlap between these these uh, behaviors that we're talking about. So there's psychology, and I might add, also add sociology, which is the study of culture and how that influences our behavior, and theology, which is uh, spiritual influences on us in terms of how that influences our behavior and how we react to environment and, and react to each other. And so um, behavior is really <laughs> interesting, but it's complex, just to say that. So the, the complexity is really cool because not only is it all over the place, but it can also be studied as a continuum. And so we have over here on the left, as you can see, something called innate behavior. So this is something that's sort of clearly genetically programmed. So I'm going to say most simple, but don't don't confuse most simple with being um, not as good or um, it, uh, inferior. Because let's make things perfectly clear. If something's working, it's it's perfectly fine. It's sufficient. And so I just want to acknowledge that. Don't don't hierarchy these behaviors based on some sort of arbitrary, uh, you know favoritism. And so what I'm saying about innate behavior is that it's very simple behavior, and it's genetically programmed, and it's instinctive. In other words, it's, you don't learn this, it just comes like, for example, these sea turtles here, they're very cute, As soon as they're hatched from their eggs on the beach, uh, they instinctively or it's innate be behavior to start running towards the water because they get, get in the water, they're, they're actually under a lot of danger if they don't. And so that spans the gamut. We're going to look at all the different types of behaviors in between innate behavior and learned behavior. And I, I alluded to this before. Learned behavior is experience based modification. And so uh, I think we're most familiar with this in terms of learning. And so let's look at this innate behavior. And so one of the uh, one of the interesting examples of innate behavior is something called fixed fixed action pattern. And the name sort of is makes it easy to remember because it's fixed, meaning that it's unchanged, and, there, and it's a pattern, meaning that it's sort of a sequence of behaviors that an organism does that's carried on to completion once it begins, and it's always stimulated by something, some sort of stimulus. It's called a sign stimulus. Now, it sounds complex, but it's not really. Let me give you some examples of this. And so, for example, a newborn baby will... Uh, fixed action pattern will be if you put your your finger in their finger they'll immediately clutch it now that's kind of a crucial that so the sign stimulus is sort of feeling something in between your fingers now holding on to something is pretty pretty important if you're a baby evolutionarily speaking holding on to mother also if you look at this picture down below this is called the rooting reflex now the rooting reflex is if you stimulate like the top of the lips of a baby it'll immediately open up its mouth really large in order to latch on to the breast in order to breastfeed. So the sign stimulus is sort of a, a tickling of the cheek and upper lip, and then it'll, it'll root and latch on. And so that's a fixed action pattern. One of the classics 
it's in every textbook, is the the geese. And so the geese, you know, here's a mother mother goose, and you know she's she's a great mother. And so the thing is, she takes care of the eggs and she sits on the nest and and protects them and and incubates them. But it the thing is, if an egg were because they're sort of roundish, they can roll out of the nest. And so if it rolls out of the nest, which is, and if there's an object uh, that's round just outside of the nest, that's sort of the sign stimulus. And, and the mother goose goes out there with its beak and starts retrieving it. And so it's kind of like this picture right here. Do you see how the mother uh, goose goes out and grabs anything over here and starts rolling it back in? It's pretty smart. Huh? But the truth is, scientists like to be kind of you know, messing around with the with the goose. And so what's interesting is they could put sort of a, an inappropriate object there, like a little dog toy or a doorknob or cue ball or something like this. And it's it's kind of silly, but the, the mother goose attempts to retrieve that as well. And so, I don't know, maybe it's not as smart as we think. Here's another uh, really weird example of an innate behavior, sort of instinctive. So this... It's a roundabout example, so so roll with this. So there's this bird called the European cuckoo, uh, cuckoo. okay, and it's it's a rather big bird. And as it turns out, <clears throat> what this bird does is it can lay its eggs. The female lays its eggs in the nest of another bird, okay. And so this is what's called brood parasitism. Okay, laying its egg. Do you notice how this egg right here is larger than these eggs? And so it lays its eggs in the nest of another species, like for example, uh, a wobbler, okay? Or warbler, as you, sorry for mispronouncing it. So the big cuckoo, as it turns out, cuckoo bird, it, it hatches. And what it does is that it pushes out the eggs of the, of the, uh, of the warbler bird. So kind of brutal. So it's a parasite. And what happens is, the, when the mother warbler comes back, uh, it, the fixed action pattern is basically any bird that is sort of with its mouth open. If you're familiar with this, when birds are hungry, baby birds are sort of ar, 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 like this. And so the mother sees this and instinctively feeds it, even though it's ridiculously not its own child. <laughs> it's a, I, I find this to, to just be remarkable. And so I think, you know, this this has got to be the dumbest bird ever. It should be called the cuckoo, <laughs> the warbler. But the truth is, even though it's feeding the cuckoo like this, it's not really that uh, that dumb because it starts to maybe identify the fact that, that the eggs don't really belong there. Like, hey, this egg is the wrong color or it's a little bit larger. Hmm. Starts to get suspicious. And so how do, how do you like this? Over, over the years, natural selection favors the parasitic, it's not just the cuckoo, the parasitic egg to resemble that of the warbler egg. And so therefore it's more difficult for the warbler mother to, to identify this. Look at this. These are the warbler eggs in different location and, and different eggs from the parasitic birds next to it. They're almost indistinguishable. Unbelievable. So these are all different kinds of cuckoo eggs, and look how they resemble the different kinds of birds that, that are in that particular area. Kind of interesting. So another example of fixed action pattern is good old bats. You know, bats are nocturnal. They come out at nighttime. They use echolocation, which is like a little radar system, sending out waves, and, and they can find things even though they can't see it. And so what's interesting is the moth, when it detects these vibrations and echolocations, it has a little sense organ uh, on its, on it, right below its wing that can detect that. So that's the sign stimulus. When the moth feels that, the, that there's a bat bearing down on it, it'll simply fold its wings and just dive to the ground with the hope that maybe it doesn't get eaten. And so it repeats that pattern stereotypically every single time, and that's innate, that, that's genetically programmed. And then here's another one, in case you... I, I presume that you're understanding fixed action pattern, but I think some of these examples are interesting and I, I couldn't refuse to, to bring them up. I have that tendency. And so here's a male stickleback, three spine stickleback fish. And as it turns out, the male 
has a behavior of, of being aggressive when it sees another male. And as it turns out, the males have the, the sort of red uh, belly. And as it turns out, when you study these stickleback fish in an aquarium, you can sort of mess with them a little bit. And you can try different um, sort of models and see what how their behavior is. And so the, the sign stimulus is anything, it doesn't even have to look like a fish, anything with red on the bottom, it's going to react to it. So that's a sign stimulus. So how about this? So when you use a fish model that looks exactly like a stickleback, it eh, doesn't care. <laughs> doesn't even react to it. So that, that's kind of interesting. And so what I wanted to say is that evolutionary um, biology really determines behavioral uh, manifestations. And so behavioral ecology is the result of evolution. And, and there's so many examples of this. All of it is an example, but here's, here's something that drives it home. The fact that, that, that males sing, okay, so they're attracting mates. But here's the thing. They just don't sing the same song. They have many songs. It's like they have a, uh, like an, an iPod that has like a huge playlist. And so as it turns out, you know, what, what's up with all these repertoire of songs? Why, did, why is it important? And so as it turns out, when this is studied, the female bird actually listens to these all these different calls and, and songs, and it, they'll actually mate with the males that have the greatest diversity in songs. And so, you know, what, what gives with this? Well, perhaps, I mean, we, we don't know these things for sure, but perhaps, as it turns out, the female is choosing the male that has the, it has the most maturity, the most experience, the one that is a little bit older, the one that would be the better provider. Uh, in other words, the better genes for their offspring. And so how do you like that? And so singing different songs is related to fitness, not only in singing, but how about this behavior? There's this bird called the bower bird. It's the most incredible, I can, sorry for the hyperbole, but this, I really mean it, the Bowerbird. Look this up, Bowerbird, on YouTube and, and check out some videos because a, a picture isn't going to do it. And I don't, I don't want it to go too, too long. But the Bowerbird is this male bird. And as it turns out, its behavior is that it builds a bower, which is this, it gets all kinds of stems and leaves and twigs, and it creates this like ultimate home, this like condominium, it's a beautiful house. And not only does it build a beautiful house, and this is the behavior is trying to attract the female, it's a courtship ritual, but it also in adorns the house with fruit and nuts and flowers and uh, bugs that it collects and it lays it out and it cleans it up and, and it's just incredible. And so again, the female, it's thought that It'll want to mate with a bower bird that has the best bower because by having the best home, uh, you're more likely to have like the best genes and therefore it'll increase your fitness and uh, to carry on. These homes are so incredible that they literally have support beams inside of them to keep them up because they're so they're so elaborate. And here's something: what's interesting is sometimes males will will have bright coloration or, or, or bright plumage. And so what that d usually does is attracts females. But, you know, there's a trade-off by looking so attractive. You can also attract the predator. So this bower bird is kind of clever because it doesn't rely on fancy-dancy plumage. It's rather drab, actually. But it uses its behavior. It's able to roll with whatever flowers are available, whatever fruit or nuts are available at the, at the time being. <laughs> impressive. And so foraging behavior is feeding. So this is what an organism does in order to survive, uh, in order to have children. So feeding behavior, what do you mean feeding behavior? So when do you feed? Do you feed during the day or at night? Um, how much energy do you spend foraging? Because again, this is a trade-off. If you spend too much time foraging, then you're not going to have enough time for mating or doing other things. Or if you could put yourself in harm's way by foraging too much. And so it's all the, be the behaviors associated with, with feeding. And so 
uh, scientists that study this come up with something called the optimal foraging model. And so this is kind of interesting. And so it's any foraging behavior that sort of is this compromise. And so where it, you get the maximum nutrition without, with the least effort. And so for humans, this would be like ordering takeout. <laughs> You're kicking back, uh, watching the Giants game, and a pizza comes. <laughs> That's pretty optimal foraging. But in terms of in, in real uh, nature, um, natural selection favors a behavior in which it minimizes the cost of foraging, but yet maximizes the benefit of eating. And here's an example of this with crows. Now crows um, are fascinating uh, birds. And so as it turns out, this Northwestern crow uh, likes to eat this, this uh, shelled organism over here, this mollusk. And as it turns out, it's difficult to crack the shell. And so the amount of energy it takes to crack the shell is, like for example, if it, the bird flew really high up, really high up and dropped it, the shell might crack. But boy, that's a lot of effort going so high up. So that's, that's one extreme. But maybe some of the crows are like, hey, what I'm going to do is only go up like one meter and then drop it and then another meter and drop it, another meter, drop it. And so it keeps doing this over and over. You know, that's exhausting. <laughs> and so this is what we mean about optimal foraging. So do you see where I'm getting at? It's like, what's the, and this is studied remarkably, what's the height at which it's the least number of drops necessary. So you don't want to go so high, but you don't want to go so low. Like, what is it? What is that right amount? I don't know if you could, if you could determine it based on, on this. If you want to pause the video and see if you can figure it out. Based on this data, uh, a biologist would say, hmm, I can see by taking down these numbers, this is like observational, I have a feeling uh, I know exactly or at least ballpark, where the crow is going to fly. See if you can figure it out. Well, here's the answer. Spoiler alert, it's five meters. And so as it turns out, this is the prediction. And so when, when this is actually determined, how about this, the crow flies 5.2 meters. And so that's the least amount of effort that gets the maximum amount of breakage. And so this can be, again, experimentally determined. I find that to be pretty interesting. And so, Another example of optimal foraging is this fish called the bluegill. That's a bluegill, and it likes to eat um, these little tiny things like the uh, water fleas, like Daphnia. And as it turns out, you know, if you're a fish, you're going to want the big, juicy uh, Daphnia. Who wants to eat the small, ridiculous one? And if you do, you have to eat a lot of them. You'd rather eat these big ones. But the thing is, if there's not that many around, there's not that many big ones around. You're like, eh, um, you know, if I keep searching for the big guy, it's going to be exhausting. I might as well, see, this is the trade-off, eat the small ones. But maybe your hypothesis is if the density of the big juicy one is high, then like forget the small ones. I'm only going with the big juicy. So check this out. When you look at uh, the data here, like for example, if you look at if the the prey density, if there's a lot of big ones, so there's a lot of large prey, maybe your prediction would be, like we were just saying, that they're going to just choose the large one. And as it turns out, they do. When you actually look at what they're eating, they choose the large one over the small and medium one when the large prey is most abundant. But when they're low prey density, in other words, they're sort of equal amounts, like third, 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 then, you know, again, why would the fish spend its whole day searching for a big, big one when it can eat these small ones? And so there's sort of a compromise. And again, natural selection sort of controls this. Um, and so finally, um, I just want to talk about this last example with the deer. This is a picture of deer that are grazing in Tuolumne Meadow in Yosemite National Park. It's beautiful. And you might say to yourself, you know, what gives with these deer? You know, if I was a deer, why would I eat grass in the meadow? Like I might like hide over here in a tree or something like this. But as it turns out, it's a little safer to feed in the meadow because you're more, more likely to see if there's a predator coming. And so, again, 
uh, selection probably encouraged organisms to not only feed together, so there's many eyes and ears to hear if a predator is coming, but you also uh, can notice if something's coming as well. And so I hope you enjoyed this first video on animal behavior. Thanks for watching.